Good afternoon. <clears throat> I um, met with Kyle Turley over lunch and we decided we're going to try and pass some legislation about mic height limitations. <laughs> so, I, it's an ADA issue for all th those of us who are taller. We feel it would be only fair to have mics that reach where we are. I'm going to uh, take a, um, I'm going to, uh, can you, can, am, I, am I loud enough out there? I am going to take a moment, um, I'm going to take a, uh, I'm going to steal a play from Dr. Mishulam's playbook from his comments last night at dinner, because I think there is a similarity between those speaking immediately after lunch and those speaking immediately after dinner. And uh, so I, I do have some formal comments to make, but I also, I, I will be telling a story because I thought his story last night was absolutely wonderful for those of you who got to hear it. And, I think it's actually part of the, the, the documentary that was done about him. Uh, the story in particular about how he, and he relayed some of it this morning, went to, uh, to the police to, to essentially take cannabis that was confiscated and, and use it for science. I think it's just a fantastic story. Um, I, I'd like to echo also something that was said earlier. This, this, I believe, truly will, when we look back in a decade from now, uh, I think this day today in this auditorium will be considered a milestone event. And I'm just a real, um, I, I'm just so honored to be part of it. And I do, I will say, I do feel a little bit like an undergrad student at a graduate lecture. So you'll, I hope you'll bear with me. Um, so my story, my story is, and some of you have heard it. So for those of you who heard it, I apologize for repeating. But my story is about these two little girls. This is, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> so this is Eddie and Cassie when they were little kids and, um, in 2005. And today they're 14. I think in this picture they were give or take uh, a little over a year. Um, they were, they were hell-bent to be movie stars. Uh, running around, uh, you know, around age three, age four, we began to see a little bit of notice of wobble in their gait, a little bit of developmental delay. Um, but we had a perfect life at that time. Uh, this is my wife, Chris. She's sitting in the audience with a different t style of hair. Um, <laughs> ultimately, we ended up in the hospital for testing. Um, it actually was initially diagnosed by uh, their pediatric doctor, Dr. Sorensen, uh, discovered that they both had enlarged spleens. It was initially diagnosed as mononucleosis, which commonly uh, manifests itself in enlarged spleens. But we quickly realized that that was far more than that. Uh, we went through a battery of testing. The uh, diagnosis, the odyssey of diagnosis, took uh, well in excess of 18 months, uh, including uh, what you see here, which is the beginning of the EEG, EEG process. Ultimately, they were di diagnosed with a really horrible and largely fatal uh, untreatable uh, cholesterol disorder called neiman pick type C. This is a lysosomal storage disorder. Uh, it, it manifests itself. All those little red dots on that, on that chromosome sequence are uh, known uh, genetic defects of that particular chromosome, the MP, MPC gene, the MPC gene. So my kids have what's called MPC type C, which means that they do not process cholesterol either in or out of uh, their cells well, particularly their organ cells, which is why they got large and enlarged spleens. But most importantly and most uh, deadly is the, uh, the, the uh, death that happens to their brain cells. And so it's a very severe neurodegenerative disease from the onset of symptoms, which in my children took place in around their third year. Uh, their life expectancy is somewhere between four and five years beyond that point. It's an auto-recessive gene. I won't dive into this. This is my you know, undergraduate work, and it'll bore most of you to tears. So we ended up at the Mayo Clinic, as many folks do. Um, met with a doctor at the Mayo Clinic who specializes in neiman Uh He essentially told us that there was one experimental drug that was improved in Europe, not approved in the United States. If we could convince our insurance company to spend the 100000 a year per kid to put them on it, uh, we could use it as treatment for our children. And it was only expected to make a 10% difference in the outcome. Uh, wasn't a good diagnosis and certainly wasn't a good uh, uh, prediction of outcome. 
We then ended up at the NIH in Bethesda. Um, there was an, a natural history study underway, uh, sponsored by the NIH, and thank God it was underway because it became the basis in some ways for what we ultimately achieved as parents to find a drug for our kids. My wife and I immediately formed a research foundation, raised a few million dollars and started putting it to work, uh, piggybacking off then already existing research in the NPC community from very, very, very fine researchers. Um, and frankly, we entered into the ecosystem of NPC at a very fortunate time. So the kids went through a full week of testing at the NIH, uh, and our life changed immediately. We became citizen scientists. My wife and I have technology and public relations backgrounds predominantly. We met at Netscape. I spent my early part of my career at Apple and other technology companies. But we became scientists. And what we discovered along the way very quickly was a compound called cyclodextrin. Cyclodextrin is a grass compound. It's used as an incipient, as a solubilizer in many, many products. It's the basis for the product Febreze. It's in almost every single Procter & Gamble product. It's used in mayonnaise to enhance flavor. It's used in uh, soft drinks, chewing gum, you name it. You're, you're surrounded by cyclodextrin almost anywhere you go in our country. It turns out that cyclodextrin is an active ingredient and is now in phase two, three clinical research at the NIH to treat my children's disease. We were the first, uh, my kids were the first to see this disease, so I've already talked a little bit about this. So we became drug developers. The, the problem is that the drug was only available in pharmaceutical grade as part of another drug. It was manufactured by Janssen Pharmaceuticals, a subsidiary of J&J. &J. We reached out to J&J &J and said, hey, how'd you like to share your drug master file and your manufacturing technology so that we can make this drug ourselves? <laughs> yeah, and that was pretty much what they said in response. You know, and, uh, and my wife being who she is, those of you who know, know what I'm about to say, she didn't take no for an answer, and she immediately wrote a blog that says, said, effectively, does Johnson & Johnson care about children? And the answer was, yes, we care about children, and oh, by the way, we've rethought our position, and we will not, we will not only share your, our drug master file for the use of cyclodextrin as an active ingredient in your drug, we will actually set up a manufacturing facility and make this drug, not only for your children, but for all the children in the world that can get a compassionate use IND approved by the FDA, by their doctor, and subsequently now, I think about 100 kids around the world are on this amazing drug. And effectively, what we're talking about is translational medicine. We're talking about repurposing an existing compound. In this case, it wasn't known as an active ingredient, has subsequently become so. And we're repurposing it in the translational medical science. Uh, and that took filings with the FDA. You'll notice the pink binders. Those are unique colors to our children. And my wife chose them so that they would get attention at the FDA and ultimately get our approval. So in less than 18 months after our diagnosis at the, uh, at the hand, at, um, Ultimately, the diagnosis took place out of testing from Stanford, but uh, within 18 months out of the test, with, with the testing, we had submitted and gotten approval to treat our children with cyclodextrin intravenously. Uh, by the way, we had tried it through the gut initially only to find out that, that, that it doesn't pass through into the bloodstream. And more importantly, once we started treating our children intravenously, we discovered through follow-up research that we had sponsored that it doesn't really pass the blood-brain barrier very well either. So not only did we file an IND for intravenous treatment of cyclodextrin with our children, we then subsequently filed another compassionate use IND with the FDA to get our kids treated intrathecally. In other words, a spinal tap straight into their spinal cord. And for the last four and a half, five years, they have been receiving, every other week they receive either an intravenous infusion, which turns out does actually, in small quantities, pass the blood, blame, blood, blood the BBB. Uh, but it also turns out it helps their, their systems, their organs and so forth, clear cholesterol. Uh, and the, on the off week, we take them to the hospital, they're fully anesthetized and they receive a spinal tap to receive this drug into their uh, CSF. And it has, we believe, extended their life by quite a lot. They are now uh, 12 years old. Here's uh, the initial installation of their ports for the intravenous infusion, so they get a mainline port infusion every, every other week. 
on Thursdays. And here's the very first compounds that we made. These compounds were actually made at, our, at the pharmacy in our local hospital in Reno, Nevada. They were compounded by this wonderful man on the left. His name is Adam Porath. He's a little known pharmacist, hospital pharmacist, who uh, I think is part of an amazing story um, that is now saving other children's lives. He was the first one to figure out how to do all the osmolarity testing, all of the necessary uh, sterilization, because we were actually receiving the compound in a powder form and it had to be turned into a drug that would be acceptable to the FDA to be not only infused into the, into the bloodstream, but also into the, past the blood-brain barrier. Here are the kids receiving their infusions at the infusion center at Reno. So 400 plus, I think it's now more than 500 IV infusions later, they get mega doses. Uh, you know, we started, we started down the path. By the way, Walgreens uh, has been unbelievable in this process. They actually helped us work through a third IND, which got us approval to treat our children at home. So we no longer have to take them to the hospital for this treatment. We have a little pump that we treat them at home. So uh, cyclodextrin, then the, the whole effort took off. So we worked with the NIH. The NIH uh, ultimately licensed or sublicensed all of the data that we collected as IND patients, plus a whole bunch of data they created in-house through a small, I think, N of six uh, phase one sort of safety clinical study. It's now in phase two dash three uh, on the fast track uh, phase study supported by a company called Vitesse who licensed all the technology and is taking over the drug as a, as a manufacturer. So it's a great story. Um, and our dream was a sterile solution that was, you know, available for both IV and IT and it's, and it's now happening. So there it is, manufactured by Janssen, available in sterile bottles. And I give, I have to say, I, we just don't do this enough. I want to give public credit to Janssen J&J &J for, for stepping up and doing this. They didn't have to do it. It was risky on their part, and they were just amazing, amazing partners in this whole process. So uh, the twins are still alive. They had their 12th birthday last January. I think that's amazing in and of itself. After all these treatments, we've seen no toxicity uh, creeping in. Their plasma oxyterol biomarkers have really improved, especially their seven keto cholesterol uh, levels. Tau and A beta levels are dropping. Uh, almost all the signs of, of neurological uh, stress, inflammation, or degradation are, are, are improving as a result of this. It turns out, and we've already talked a little bit about mechanism of action and the mysteries of mechanism of action, it turns out during this entire process, not, none of the scientists involved had any idea how cyclodextrin was working. The assumption is that it was working similar to the way that cholesterol, you know, uh, is, that, that odors are captured by Febreze. It turns out that that's not the case. And just this last week, a seminal paper was published about cyclodextrin and its use in the treatment of atherosclerosis, which elucidated its mechanism of action. And uh, that's, a day, that's for another day, but exciting. Okay, so we sort of stabilized our children with a drug through the FDA process, became aware of what's involved in doing that. Um, really respect those of you who are involved in that process because it is daunting and involved and expensive and time consuming. But it wasn't helpful for my kids' seizures. Our kids suff began suffering several years ago from nowhere near the Dravet kids sort of levels of seizures, but still an, an, a, a disturbing level of seizure activity. We did like every other parent does. We tried to treat it with pharmaceutical meds. It basically just turned our kids into zombies, had horrible side effects for them, uh, and decided to chase uh, cannabis. It turns out that Dr. Gupta's story, um, the, you know, weed one about the Stanleys and Charlotte's Web and so forth was just coming out, uh, or had, you know, after we, about six months after we started looking at it, Long story short, uh, we had already been, Sanjay had already been covering our story about cyclodextrin in our kids, so we had been interacting with him, and he had mentioned to us, as had others, about trying cannabis. So this is actually a, a picture of one of the very first bottles of oil that we used when we treated our kids. We started this treatment several years ago. Uh, we, we're, this bottle is approximately an 18 to 1 CBD to THC ratio uh, suspended in a, a safflower oil. What we discovered in the process of treating our kids with essentially uh, what, I, what I would largely say is a very sophisticated home 
grown oil was that the supply of this oil and its safety was of paramount importance to us. So we took what we had learned in our process of you know, working with cyclodextrin and building a drug through the FDA and formed a company that we call Strains. Strains purpose in life is to be a world-class, high-quality manufacturer of cannabino can cannabinoid, in other words, cannabis-based products in oil form and in other routes of administration as possible by state regulation. So we uh, embarked um, and have just recently announced uh, $8 million in funding to launch our product development, or more importantly, our product manufacturing efforts in the state of Colorado, Washington State, and Nevada. Um, we have facilities built and ready to produce products in Seattle, Denver, and soon to finish in Reno as well. Here's an example of the machine that we use. This is a 70 liter CO2 extraction machine. It's just one part of a complex process of making these oils to the highest grade standards that we know how to make and I, I think to, to what the industry is making at this time. We make a multi-ratio product, 20 to one, one to 20, and one to one in the middle. Uh, and from these three products, a parent or a patient could come up with a, a ratio of their own design, obviously capped by 20 to 1 at the high end on the CBD spectrum. So I want to talk a little bit about, so that, that's our story, that's my story, and here's, I, I know that the title of my talk for today was, was about rescheduling. So out of necessity, I have become a little bit of a cannabis policy wonk because uh, it worries me as a business person to take my investors' money without a clear path for how they're going to get their returns. Uh, I want to make these medicines under the belief that we can actually get them out to lots and lots of people, and ultimately, as I think we all know, that's going to require some form of rescheduling. Um, I'm not sure that rescheduling is the answer. I will say that if I could mag wave my magic wand and convince the cannabis community, I think we should hold our ground and insist on a descheduling. Or, or the creation of a... I think we, or, or better yet, the creation of a parallel path. Let's face it, tobacco and alcohol are on a parallel path. They're not on schedule anything, uh, although they arguably should be, certainly if cannabis is. So I would like to see, the, there, there's already a, a movement afoot. The states have already said, we're, gonna, we're going to authorize the creation of cannabis. Let's let the federal government embrace that idea, let's let the states regulate the product, let's layer on top of that federal regulation which really focuses on the GMP process. Our facilities are designed to, to GMP CFR 111, which is the nutraceutical or dietary supplement standard. I think that that's the minimum standard that should be established. I'd like to see the federal government insist that the states enforce that standard just as they insist that the states enforce things like diversion or proximity to schools and so forth. So there are ways to regulate this product without putting it into the, the drug schedule and certainly, most importantly, without putting it into the crosshairs of the FDA for you know, the full Monty on, on, on drug approval process. There are so many incarnations of this drug that can be delivered as a dietary supplement um, and, the, and we, that should be allowed. And I, I just hope that we can figure out as a society how to do that. Okay, one more soapbox. Cannabis belongs to mankind. Cannabis does not belong to one company, one brand, one method of action, one process technology. It belongs to all of us. I come from a world that pretty much embraced open source technology in the software community. Open source as a concept has become uh, further and more recognized as a viable capital endeavor. I'd like to suggest that we as a community make a pact with each other to treat cannabis as a shared asset and not to lock it up, not to put it behind the pharma fence, not to put it in a cage where people can't make it unless they have a patent on it. This is, uh, this is one of my, as a parent and as a patient advocate, one of my worst nightmares is that we will, um, you know, not learn from the, fr from the past. Finally, to uh, somewhat in honor of Dr. Mishulam, certainly, but uh, in honor of my children and all the patients out there who need more understanding. Dr. Goldstein this morning talked about it. Almost everyone has talked about it. We need far more research, especially human clinical research. So, in the spirit of not having enough to do, my wife and I 
got together and we asked the IRS to give us approval to create a research foundation called PeopleCan. PeopleCan is now approved as a 501c3 specifically to fund, organize, and orchestrate human clinical research in cannabis worldwide. Uh, we actually just, thank you. We actually just got approval and we just hired an executive director. I'd like Jason to stand up. Jason Smith. So we're just getting started and the first task is to raise a little money to, to, to build out the infrastructure. Uh, I am of the opinion, um, informed I hope in opinion, that it is possible to do clinical research on cannabis in the United States without the DEA's approval, without even the FDA's approval. This, this product is a dietary supplement in many of its forms and we can research it uh, as such. And so we intend to work with the IRB community, figure out a way to get this done and embrace the rest of you in that process. So um, I hope you'll engage with us in that process on, on many levels. Thank you very much.